Good morning, afternoon, evening. Welcome to another episode of the Best DFS Show that just happens to start at 8 Eastern Standard Time. My name is Rob Diamond, Rad Rob Diamond on Twitter, Sir Robert Six and all the main sites. Welcome to another EPL breakdown for the Wednesday main slate for January 2nd, 2019. Uh, I don't want to waste too much time here. We'll quickly go over the slate today and what we can expect from each team. Uh, as far as I can tell at this time, it's going to look like there's going to be a lot of goals to slate. There's going to be a lot of points. There's going to be a lot of different players that should go off. And at the end of the day, it's really going to come down to who you best think will do better than the rest. Uh, you really can't go wrong here. There's going to be a lot of different points to uh, be shared by numerous stacks, uh, numerous teams, numerous goals. So yeah, let's just jump right into it here right away. Uh, starting off, we can uh, take a quick look here at uh, the schedule. Obviously, there were some games yesterday, uh, but uh, for today we have uh, a uh, excuse me, six game schedule with uh, one late game and the five uh, normal time games starting uh, this afternoon. Uh, so uh, Crystal Palace is traveling to Wolves. Southampton is traveling to Chelsea. Watford is traveling to Bournemouth. Brighton is heading to West Ham. Burnley uh, traveling to Huddersfield. And Man United is uh, just traveling a little bit east there to Newcastle. So yeah, let's uh, let's jump right into the slate here right away. Um Born, or Watford at Bournemouth, excuse me. So uh, a lot of this game will have to do with Bournemouth and their home away splits. And the fact is that they've been excellent at home, uh, but uh, incredibly poor away from home. And in their last 10 games, I think they've played Man United twice, Spurs, Liverpool, Arsenal, uh, and I think City as well. I'm not 100% sure on that, but like six of their past 10 games, uh, they've lost eight of their past 10, but six of them have been against the top six, uh, five of the top six, excuse me, with Man United being played twice. So, yeah, uh, a lot of people are going to look at Bournemouth and they're not going to expect a lot of different things, especially if they just look at it face value from their most recent form. Uh, and Not many people will be jumping on Bournemouth, and they should and really could be one of the highest scoring teams of this slate. Uh, I'm definitely not looking at the defense for this game. I don't think, uh, in terms of Bournemouth, excuse me, I don't think there's much to offer in terms of defense, but as always, basically every single game for Watford, you can try and go for a defensive stack in GPP. I really don't recommend it away from home or in general as is, but especially away from home against Bournemouth. Uh, but as always, Holboss is someone that you can look towards for double-digit crosses if he's getting the start. Uh, we've seen his salary dip a little bit here thanks to some restricted minutes and in in turnover in recent weeks. Uh, rotation, excuse me, not turnover. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm definitely looking for a little bit of Holboss this late. Uh, I would only use it in cash if that. Uh, it still isn't my favorite cash play, but it's something that you can do uh but in terms of see the issue here is that Watford aren't bad uh they're definitely good enough to score a couple goals but I'm not sure if they're actually good enough to beat Bournemouth at Bournemouth uh Del Feu, uh absolutely it's tough because this slate especially in some of these games where both teams should be doing well everyone's priced too high. Like, uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, I don't mind Del Feu at 7.1. Uh, I don't mind Ryan Frazier at 8.1. But when you break down the rest of the slate here, there's really not a lot of reason to pay up for these numbers, especially whenever we look at teams like Burnley, who really could surprise, or West Ham, who should absolutely smash an away Brighton team to smithereens. So, uh, like, I really like this game a lot. I really like all the players involved. Ryan Frazier's probably my favorite of the entire bunch on either teams. And on top of that, I really do like either Cal Wilson or Josh King and uh, trying to get a stack there. Um, in what, what's the say? Eleven games. Uh, these two time, these two teams have met eleven times. Excuse me, that that came out really badly. And of those eleven times, uh, there's been seven penalty shots awarded to Bournemouth. Uh, so that's the highest rate of conceded uh, or created penalty shots in all of English professional football since Watford came back to the league in 2013. So yeah, don't uh, don't be afraid to chase a penalty shot here for Bournemouth. It wouldn't really surprise me to see. Callum Wilson or Josh King end up with a penalty shot goal at the end of the 90 minutes. The big thing here will be, can Bournemouth outscore the likes of West Ham at home, uh, of the likes of uh, Wolves, or even, I know this is a big stretch, or uh, outscore the likes of Newcastle. Uh, I definitely like 
born with the outscore the likes of Newcastle, but against uh, but comparing them to West Ham or Wolves, this may not be very much of a discussion, especially when we consider the salaries are just obscene uh, compared to West Ham and Wolves. The only guy that really stands out as maybe again being too expensive is uh, Philippe Anderson. Uh, but honestly, taking Philippe Anderson, Ryan Anderson, and GPP, I think is uh, excuse me, Ryan Frazier in GPP is a really sharp uh, start to your cards. A lot of that has to do with the fact that their salaries are scary high and not many people will be be able to afford them once they start buying Hazard and uh, etc. So in terms of Bournemouth, it, a lot of this basically will come down to whether or not they keep a clean sheet. If they can keep a clean sheet, uh, obviously they're going to win. Uh, if they don't keep a clean sheet, there's a really strong chance that they're going to draw here. I don't see a Bournemouth loss. I don't see a Watford victory coming from this game. Bournemouth's just been too good at home, and Watford's been really poor away. So in, in terms of scoreline, I like 2-1 Bournemouth, probably 2-2. Two, two. Uh, but yeah, in terms of clean sheet, I definitely wouldn't look this direction. Next game on the slate, we have Southampton traveling to Chelsea. There's not really a whole lot to talk about here other than Southampton are absolutely garbage, especially defensively. Uh, they're most likely being relegated this season. There's not a lot of hope. They got a new manager, uh, I think, five weeks ago now. In the first two games, he won, and he's lost three straight since then, conceding obscene amounts of goals. Uh, and that's really one of his bigger issues, uh, too. Uh, I can't think. I'm sorry. I, yeah, I, I better look it up just to just to be safe here. It's a really hard name to pronounce. That's why I'm Ralph Hasnoti. Hasnoto. Hasnoto. Um, anyways, he was the manager of uh, Leipzig in Germany, and he took a really young team there to the uh, Champions League. Uh, but uh, it was no secret then. It's no secret now. Defense was never his strong suit. So look for Southampton to, to continue conceding goals at an incredibly high rate. And we can look for Chelsea to potentially do something in, uh, in exchange. And I completely forgot, as usual, like I always do, I forgot to talk about the FanDuel part here too. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, just jumping back over here again. Whenever we look at the forwards here, a lot of the issues, as usual, on FanDuel for forwards is there's no midfield forward designation for the player. So you're kind of forced into a situation where you have to take a player that isn't really a cash play in forward because there's no real other cash options. And you may have to look at someone like Callum Wilson the slate at 9K as one of those options. Um, it's just there's not a lot of value uh, to be had on the forward slate in terms of any kind of floor output. Like uh, maybe Glenn Murray if he starts, but really you want to target Brighton away from home for cash. Like that's just not a viable script in the slightest whatsoever so like i said uh if you're not jumping all over the chance like pedro's not playing so that basically cuts the chelsea options out in half because murad is not viable um jimenez maybe against crystal palace like uh, yeah like even if you want to go at the top marshall is barely a cash play Barely, uh, simply because he doesn't have the kind of floor needed to even be a cash viable player. So there's no there's no cash plays in forward for Fanduel this slate. So you're going to have to just chase the goals and chase the shots, and maybe if you can find someone that creates chances, maybe roll with some chance creation. Uh, but in terms of like I said, the the Bournemouth Watford, you may just have to roll with some Callum Wilson or some Delafeu. Uh, either or is uh, probably a route you're going to have to go through. It, even in the case that it doesn't really make sense. So yeah, like I said, 2-1 Bournemouth. But sorry, that's frustrating, especially for me, because I want to press stop and start this whole video over again and do it right, but I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's, I'm too deep into this now. We're too far gone. So yeah, let's uh, let's jump right back in here to Southampton traveling to Chelsea. Uh, Southampton just don't have a hope in hell here. Chelsea have something I've seen like 12 straight victories against Southampton. Uh, it's just not looking good for Southampton, who are just outside the relegation zone on on goal differential. And considering this next game we're talking about here with Burnley, Southampton's probably going to find themselves in the relegation zone following 90 minutes of this slate. Uh, so yeah... Issue with uh, Kepa, as always, will be Chelsea don't allow enough shots on net for him to get enough saves to offset any goal that he may get. And in the case that he doesn't let, uh, get let in a goal, he's getting one to two saves tops, which is 15 fantasy points tops. And when you're talking 6K for 15 fantasy points, that doesn't that isn't viable for either format, even with the win. I think there's lots of other better keeper options to slate than Kepa, um, so I'm not 
jumping at the chance to play him, though he's safe for the win. Uh, he's just not going to see enough saves. Plain and simple. You think he's going to get a clean sheet? That's fine. He's going to do it off one save. And there's at least two other keepers this slate who are looking at a potential clean sheet from multiple saves. So that's just not something I'm chasing. Um, you can always do the uh, Lonzo. Emerson's been looking really good too. He's been playing a little bit, so uh, don't don't shy away from Emerson if he gets the start. He, uh, I know obviously his minutes haven't really been there, but uh, yeah, I assure you he's been playing quite well. And it, it's coming up to the point here where Chelsea are going to have to start going through some rotation. But yeah, Hazard's easily the play of the slate. There's no denying it. At home, he's stellar against Southampton. He's stellar against uh, weaker sides. I have absolutely no issue with Hazard and either format um, totally justifies his most expensive salary of this slate and in truth it's a, a massive jump and it's totally worth it uh, watch him do absolutely nothing now this slate because I've said all these things that's generally how DFS works for me if you haven't figured this out by already uh, but yeah Obviously, you're, you're probably going to want to get him into your forward spot just because there are so few forward options. Now, there are guys like Townsend and stuff you can get away with in cash who I still don't like and will still feverently hate and dispute uh, even though he's producing, which is kind of... I'll talk about Crystal Palace later. But yeah, um, basically, Chelsea are going to win this game. And with Pedro out, uh, we can even rely on a little bit of Willian. Uh, even in cash, I don't mind going a little bit of Willian cash. Hazard GPP, though, I'm more convinced Hazard will get uh, 90 minutes and Willian won't, making Hazard a little bit more viable for cash than Hazard. Uh, but the salary is hard to deny here at 8.2K. You can really do a lot of things, especially uh, including... Excuse me, uh, the Fleet Barris and Ryan Anderson. I keep saying Ryan Anderson. I don't know why. Ryan Frazier, Rob. Ryan Frazier. There we go. Um, and William. So, yeah, uh, I don't mind that for a little start. You're not ruining yourself, especially if you take sub 5K defenders. You'll be able to spend up a little bit on a goaltender. So, yeah, I, I really don't mind this whatsoever. A really decent start for either. It's a little bit uh, GPP heavy for G, or excuse me for cash uh, but I do like it for a GPP script um, but yeah Chelsea should win this game by at least two or three goals I'll be really surprised if they do concede if they do it shouldn't be more than once uh, probably on the backs of Ings uh, but like the issue with uh, Southampton isn't so much that um, they're a bad team, which they are. It's that Chelsea don't allow production, whether floors or ceiling. Uh, so when you're chasing, like especially the these forwards in Southampton are continually and forever the most annoying forwards in DFS. Like, if you want to just throw your money away, chase goals on Southampton. These minutes are atrocious. Easily the worst minutes in the league for any forwards. It's not even remotely close. So even if you do believe that they're going to score, they're still coming off the field at 80 minutes. Like, it's... <laughs> I don't want to say the words I want to say because it's definitely not PG-13. Like, very upsetting to me. There's very little reason to take Southampton players at, in general because of their minutes and especially going up against a team like Chelsea. Uh, so I'll definitely say at, at least a 3 nothing Chelsea win, probably closer to 4, and uh, they'll totally justify their salaries this slate. So good reason to fade them. Next we have Burnley traveling to Huddersfield. Probably my favorite game of the slate. I think there's a lot of hidden value in this game that not many people are going to look at. Especially, there's not going to be any ceilings. So don't chase this in GPP. That's the first rule for this game. Do not take in GPP. The likelihood that either of these teams will produce a slate-breaking performance, let alone a player that could go on to break the slate, is just absurdly astronomical Apollo 11 kind of, Apollo 13, excuse me, uh, kind of odds. So yeah, just uh, don't chase the GPPs here. Chase the, the simple floors, which there should be more than enough of. Uh, Johan Berg Goodmanson, all day, either format, 6.5, you have absolutely nothing to lose, uh, especially, especially, uh, I got, ha, excuse me, blah, 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 especially if uh, Robbie Brady isn't playing. Uh, all the more reason to. Uh, Philip Billing, 6.4K. Absolutely no, nothing wrong with Philip Billing. You can take both these guys in cash, in the same cash card, and you're giving up absolutely nothing. Uh, especially if Jonathan Hogg is playing the defensive midfielder role. Get Phil Billing into your cash cards with Johan Berg Goodmanson. 
probably the safest cash stack that you're going to find this entire slate. Uh, both of them, their salaries are right. I would prefer billing to be a little bit less, uh, preferably, again, closer to the 5K range. But Johan Berg Goodmanson is probably deserving of an 8K range. So you get that saving there where you're spending up on billing. And I have no issue, like I said, getting the both into your cash card. They'll be absolutely fine this slate. Uh, I'm not too keen on the defensives. Uh, I think Burnley's going to score, which ruins the ceiling for Huddersfield. And I don't think Burnley put up enough serious floors, let alone ceiling, to draw a serious consideration. Uh, this is as far as I would go with Charlie Taylor. I think uh, 4.6 is still accessible. It's definitely the max salary I'd be looking to pay for someone like Charlie Taylor who has absolutely no ceiling and just decent enough floor to not ruin you in cash. Uh, because the point of taking him was to be able to afford everyone else while just getting whatever fantasy points he gets. And now that he's at 4.6K, you can't really rely on that. Oh, we'll just get whatever Charlie Taylor gets because he costs 3 8k that just isn't the situation now so you have to be a little bit more uh concerned and aware of what charlie taylor can actually do uh, you may even want to drop down to a little bit of matthew Lowton instead uh, definitely doesn't have the same kind of floor uh but in terms of upside neither of them have it so you may just want to save the money uh because that 600 does add up uh, fairly significantly later when you get deeper into the slates uh but yeah in terms of that it's really sticking away from the forwards on both this game. I can't stress that enough. Burnley will be very, very lucky to see 90 minutes. Maybe Ashley Burns. Uh, he's been seeing some as of late. Uh, and he hasn't been that bad. Like, uh, that's an assist. So that's six points. He's still getting 10 fantasy points, which is more than enough for a floor. Uh, so this is more of a wait and see for me. See if Ashley Barnes starts stringing together some 90-minute games with a decent floor. And I would probably buy into this more. But Burnley have been so historically sub-90-minute players that there's absolutely no reason to really just jump on board here. There's too much risk. Um, and I... The, the, the Huddersfield hasn't scored a home goal with a striker yet this season. Maybe one, maybe one, uh, maybe missing on that. Uh, but yeah, it's not a team you want to go attacking. Huddersfield have easily the worst attack in the league, and it's not even remotely close. They've scored only 12 goals this season. And uh, they've been shut out nine times. Uh, that's almost half their game. So, yeah, there's just not a lot of ceiling to chase from uh, Huddersfield. But my favorite play of this slate, I'm so excited to do this. I can't stress enough how quickly I'm locking this in. And it's going to be Tom Heaton, England's best keeper, indisputable, undisputable, indisputable, whatever, my English, whatever. This is absurd. 4.3K for England's best keeper. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Tom Heaton, a quick rundown on Tom Heaton and in Burnley in general, I think is worth talking about their keepers. Um, Nick Pope and Tom Heaton were the English national team keepers two years ago. Literally, they were the two national team keepers. There was nobody else even remotely in the discussion. England was moving on. Pickford was still too young and untested. Uh, so, yeah, that, that, that was the England lineup, was Tom Heaton and Nick Pope. Now, what happened was, as usual, Tom Heaton gets hurt for two months of the season, and unlike what usually happens, excuse me, where Burnley falter and battle relegation the entire season because their main keeper has been hurt, Nick Pope stepped in, was a complete revelation to English soccer, and had a national team call up within months. So they're both very capable keepers. Obviously, both were very hurt to start the season, and Joe Hart was seeing a lot of the time. Now, uh, you don't have to be a genius to know Joe Hart just doesn't have it anymore. He didn't have it with West Ham, West Ham last season. He definitely doesn't have it with Burnley this season. Tom Heaton has it all. So the reason Tom Heaton is the best DFS goaltender in soccer is for a few reasons. First of all, his ownership. He's never going to be the highest owned keeper because he plays in Burnley. Second of all, his salary. He's never going to be the most expensive keeper because he plays on Burnley. And a lot of time that's going to draw down his uh, salary because Burnley are so bad. 
third, Burnley are really bad. So what's going to happen a lot of times is not only Tom Heaton going to be cheap, but no matter the team, he's going to face six to eight saves every single game, whether it's against Huddersfield, whether it's against Arsenal, whether it's against Liverpool. There's a serious floor of at least four saves every single game for Tom Heaton. And when we're considering this slate, he's going up against a joke team like Huddersfield. 4.3K is the most absurd salary this 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 I want to say this calendar year, but that's kind of a, a pointless statement. Um, get Tom Heaton into your cards. Easily the best goaltender in England, not alone this slate, not alone in the league. Uh, I have nothing wrong with him. He has all the capabilities to save all the stop to save all the shots that West Ham or excuse me, I keep saying West Ham that Burnley uh, will allow every game. So yeah, four point three K all day, jump on the Tom Heaton. Uh, I didn't touch on the Southampton Chelsea uh, over here because I I find that game a little bit pointless. It's the same discussion over and over. But yeah, this one is. Uh, I think this game has a chance to be pretty special. Like I said. Fade those forwards. Do not get involved. Ashley Burns, if anyone, if you have to be risky, that's who you want to go with. But it's such an unnecessary risk. Billing's a little bit too expensive over here. Uh, but Johan berg certainly is not. Uh, absolute steal. Get him into your cards. I'm not as keen about any of the defenders. A lot of that has to do with the fact that Charlie Taylor... Uh, you know what? You... Pr- you probably could get away with that at 4.5K. I was expecting it to be a little bit higher, closer to the 5K range, uh, which 500 is a massive difference in FanDuel. So, yeah, um, you can you can get away with that. Uh, and, again, like I said, uh, the price is a little bit different over here. Tom Heaton's a little bit more expensive on uh, FanDuel. It doesn't really matter. He could be 6K, and he's still the most viable keeper this slate. Due to the fact that, well, I shouldn't say 6K on Fandle. That would be a little bit heavy ass. But, like, he's still going to see all the saves. He's going to have all the ability to make all the saves. And the Huddersfield aren't very good. So that's just a recipe for success. Do I feel great about taking three Burnley players in cash for either site today? No. I would much rather drop out Charlie Taylor uh, and take Johan and Tom Heaton. Uh, But... In FanDuel, you can probably get away with taking out Heaton and putting in Charlie Taylor and Johan simply because their salaries are still too low where Heaton's is kind of getting into the range where it should be. Now, over in DraftKings, yeah, I don't I don't know if you can shy away from this game. You may need to go three or four deep in cash into this game. And it's tough because there's so many ceilings to be had everywhere else, but these salaries are just too cheap in this game, and there's nothing either team offers that's going to t- stop the other team from getting their double-digit floors in Johan and Billing and Tom Heaton and Charlie Taylor always offering that double digits. Uh, on Now on DraftKings, excuse me, if I was to drop anyone, it would easily be Charlie Taylor. Get him out of there for 4.6K. There's just no upside, and when you're in that range, you're starting to look at defenders with upside. Uh, now, Huddersfield, yeah, it, I would just stick with Billing until Aaron Moy comes back. I just don't see the purpose in chasing many of these Huddersfield guys. Uh, you could probably get away with uh, some low if Drum doesn't start. Uh, he definitely has the floor. And uh, Zanka, Zanka Jorgensen, however you want to say it, I actually, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, kind of embarrassing story. I just found out Zanka and Jorgensen are the same guy. I, I've kind of had an inkling that was the situation, but I, I had no confirmation. And it took some embarrassment on Twitter for me to find out, which is nothing, absolutely nothing new. If anyone's followed any of my social media, you'll know that's basically the only way I learn is by embarrassing myself. So, yeah, um, Zanka's a little bit too expensive at 5.4K, despite leading the team in uh, scoring, which is kind of pathetic at only th- uh, three goals this season. So, yeah, uh, I love Burnley this slate. Oh, that's gross to say. It's not fun to say. It's not easy to say. I just think they're going to be so under owned. They're way too cheap, and uh, all of them have floors. If they happen to hit a ceiling, if Johan Berg-Gudemansen happens to hit a ceiling this slate from 6.5K, he's 
potentially going to be the play of the slate. Like, he could get to 20 fantasy points in this game. Now, mind you, Burnley would need two goals, and he would need to have his hand in on both of them, along with having at least eight crosses. Uh, but that's totally doable. Uh, I don't see that being out of the question against Huddersfield. Is it some slates? Absolutely. It's not my favorite chase. Now, Burnley have been brutal away from home. Huddersfield have been better at home than away, but they've just been bad everywhere. So I'm not necessarily looking for a, a win from this slate. All I'm really looking for from Tom Heaton is to be in a low-scoring game, have the chance of four saves, and cost less than 4.5K. Like, there's nothing wrong with him in this slate. Probably my favorite play of the entire slate. And I don't like making my a keeper my favorite play of the slate because... They're so variant, and it's such a risk where if he lets in a goal and doesn't see a save, which against uh, the worst offense in the league like Huddersfield is very relevant, uh, he could be ruined even from 4.3K. But I'm all in. Tom Heaton, play of the slate, 4.3K. Burnley, 2 nothing victory today. Next play of the slate, we have Brighton traveling to West Ham. This is another game I'm absolutely in love with. Um, very simply because Brighton are easily, this isn't even this season, this is coming up to like a historic level now. They're one of the worst home and road away splits to ever grace the English Premier League. Uh, unbelievable. It's, it's not necessarily their standings or the results, which it is. Two, um, it's their their straight uh, like straight play is just incredible at home. They'll take on anyone. I talked about it last video going up against Everton. I said take Brighton, fade Everton. Everton's horrible away from home with this crazy road away split, and uh, Brighton's just incredible at the Amex Stadium with their home away split. So yeah, the slate by Brighton, sorry, I'm just not interested. Like, they're just that bad away from home. And it's coming up on one of the worst road away splits in league history. So there's just no reason to look at that at any kind of a consistent take, let alone this slate. Now, um, I think what a lot of people are going to end up doing is jumping on Fabanski. I, I don't hate it unless if Glenn Murray is starting... Do not play Fabanski. I will repeat, if Glenn Murray is starting, do not play Fabanski. Glenn Murray has scored in every career away game that he has started in London. Uh, do not mess with this guy. He is not someone to just uh, throw under the bus and think that you're going to get a clean sheet up against. He will stun you every single time, don't I know. Uh, he's got five, or sorry, excuse me, six goals against West Ham in his career, which is his personal high against any other club. Uh, am I into Glenn Murray this slate? No, not really. <laughs> I expect him at max to his ceiling to be like 14 fantasy points, uh, which even from 5.8K is a little bit too much of an ask whenever we have guys like Johan Berg Goodmanson for only like 800 more and looking at a floor of uh, the same ceiling that uh, Murray has. So. It's just not on for me in either format. Uh, I would rather take the low ownerships and uh, high floors elsewhere. But it, the relative statement to that is uh, you, you probably don't want to take Fabanski this slate at 5.4K. Uh, not ideal, especially with someone like Tom Heaton at literally more than a thousand, literally more than a thousand dollars less than West Ham's Fabanski. Like, I, I want to screen that right now, but I know you. Technically, you could be listening to headphones or you're just a few feet away from your speaker. So it's not really a, a reasonable idea. Uh, but yeah, don't don't go with Fabanski if Glenn Murray's starting. If Glenn Murray doesn't start, I'm still really nervous about Fabanski. Uh, mostly because if he comes on the field, he also has an incredible scoring, as a, a sc incredible scoring rate as a substitute. So it's just not the game I'm looking to chase the clean sheet. Uh, and... There's just no floors in the defensive uh, aspect of West Ham. There should be on guys like Cresswell, but he isn't seeing the kind of double-digit crosses that we've come to expect from him in the past. Uh, I think, like I said earlier, Philippe Anderson is an excellent play this slate. Uh, you could probably even get away with him in either format. Uh, I don't hate it. A lot of that will depend on how West Ham start with their starting 11 and if it looks like he's getting uh, the set pieces. Now, if Snodgrass is starting, uh, I'd probably prefer him. 
uh, though his minutes have started to shy away a little bit. And if Arnautovic's coming back, that's a whole other uh, situation that we have to consider here too. Now, those minutes are seriously concerning, like a legitimate concern. Uh, so it, as a whole, I'm not like as excited about West Ham as I am, for example, Burnley. Uh, but Brighton have been literally so bad away that we're looking at minimum two goals from West Ham. So it's it's tough. Like uh, It's just like Bournemouth. We're looking at literally it's, it's either got to be Bournemouth or West Ham. One of them are going to score two or more, and the other's not going to do as well as the other. And since they both cost the exact same, and they're both going to draw the same amount of ownership, um, yeah, it, it's tough. And if I was to choose between Bournemouth and West Ham, I would definitely take a Bournemouth defensive stack and a West Ham offensive stack. But that's, you know, it's just as likely to go the other way. Uh, Brighton aren't a team to fear uh, away from home. So the clean sheet is on, even with Glenn Murray playing. It's just not something I'm looking to chase. If you decide to go West Ham defensive, I wouldn't talk you out of it. Uh, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see how West Ham start their starting 11, the slate, what their formation, who they're using, and who's on the bench, and try and predict who's going to be the subs. Um, yeah, this game could go a couple different ways. It could do something simple like 2 nothing West Ham and, you know, no, nothing crazy or serious. This could just as easily go 3-2 uh, and be the sneaky shootout game of the slate. Now, is that saying go team stack or game stack this game? Absolutely not. I think there's way more viable salaries than all the different games. Uh, but in terms of uh, ownership and upside, you could probably get away with some Fleep Anderson or... Or uh, maybe uh, some uh, Arnautovic or Snodgrass and Cash if he's starting. Uh, but yeah, that's a. I, I really have no takes outside of Glenn Murray. Uh, Solly Marsh is just too expensive for Brighton away from home, and their defense is an absolute crapshoot. Uh, you're better taking just Charlie Taylor than uh, any of those guys who offer half the floors. Uh, now, obviously, you, you may look at that, but yeah, uh, this. Brighton just aren't the team to target away from home. Plain and simple. Uh, or excuse me, Brighton are a team to target when they're away from home. They're not a team to use. Uh, so I'm probably going to side with the 2 nothing idea West Ham just because that makes me feel more comfortable. But it really wouldn't surprise me to go see 2-1, 2-2, 3-2 West Ham. Uh, Brighton aren't winning. Let's say that. Brighton really, really should not win this game. Even if West Ham are at their most inept, inconsistent form, uh, a draw is probably the worst case scenario for West Ham. Next game on the slate, we have Crystal Palace traveling to Wolves. This is another game I love. Uh, Crystal Palace has been... This is the Crystal Palace rundown. I, I've Actually, I'm kind of a, a mini Crystal Palace supporter. I don't want to talk about it too much because it isn't the most proudest of subjects. But I've always really liked Crystal Palace. And their trademark is... To start the season off, like, absolutely historically, EPL history, worst starts in history, uh, like, not winning 10 straight games kind of thing, and then go on this five-game banger uh, where they'll completely change their fortunes, get out of the relegation zone, people will be hopeful, and then something will happen again, and they'll crap back down, and they'll just survive at the end of the season. This has been, like, five straight years of this exact same nonsense now. Every year it's the same thing, and we're going through the we're going through the ups swing right now for Crystal Palace and schedulely speaking uh historically speaking today should be the game where they start falling right back down again now am I predicting a Zaha injury and Crystal Palace is going to fall apart no uh but I think Wolves are coming into this with everything to win uh and Crystal Palace are coming into this with everything to lose uh real patricio 5.2k if you're looking to spend up probably the safest keeper play of the slate crystal palace are bad away uh third worst offense in the league uh with only 19 goals and getting shut out nine times so compare that to huddersfield nine times with 12 goals not that much better um so yeah i really like wolves across the board i think you can't go wrong uh, whether it's Moutinho from only 5.2K, uh, Doherty or Johnny, or even taking the entire uh, defensive stack, uh, chasing that. And uh, Gimenez is, again, like I'm not excited about the prospect of using him in cash on Fandle, but that may be something you have to do simply because uh, of the situation that we're looking at. 
uh, and which is not a lot of forward options. Now, if Arnovic does start in the West Ham Brighton game, you definitely can't give that a look, but 10K is an awful lot to ask for someone coming back from a half decently serious injury. So yeah, I would uh, I would much rather uh, keeping my exposure on someone like uh, someone like Jimenez. Uh, you can definitely roll down to the midfield with some Moutinho. I know uh, Milchevic is still doing his thing. Townsend isn't the most inept from seven point five as well. So like if you're looking to spend up on the forwards. That's a really solid core, even with those two stacking. Uh, you could drop Townsend. You could go Johan. Uh, you could go Moutinho. Who else would we want in there for cash? Uh, Billing's a little bit too expensive over here. Uh, I wonder if William, yeah, probably Hazard or William. Uh, let's just say William for the sake of this now. Uh, but yeah, I'm not crazy about Jimenez for cash. But if you're really pushed at 9.5K, I can definitely think of worse options, like Danny Ings, for example. Uh, easily one of the worst. Rondon, horrible cash option from 9K. Barely a GPP play from 9K. So, yeah. Um, what frustrates me most about Palace is that I consistently get them wrong. And a lot of that has to do, not so much with their back. I, I like Win Win Bansaka an awful lot, uh, though he's more reliant on a clean sheet to have any kind of a relevant outing. Uh, Townsend and Milicevic are basically my banes of my DFS existence. Can never really seem to nail them. When they, when I take them, things happen that shouldn't happen. And when I fade them, they just seem to win people takedowns and slates. And it's just tough, right? It's, it's really tough to understand how Palace are going to come at this. They're away from home. They're horrible away from home. Wolves is really good at home. Yeah, I, I don't know. It, it, this is a Wolves game to me. Uh, it's tough because it, my I, I, I keep envisioning in my mind lock happening. I'm opening up my head to head games and I'm seeing everyone with Max Mayer or Andrews Townsend and I'm scratching my head wondering why I'm going to lose to Palace players away from home against Wolves after they just beat Spurs. So it's just like another one of those slates I feel coming with Palace where they're just going to do stupid things and people will buy off it because they believe it makes sense. But I just see no purpose whatsoever in paying 7.8K away from home for a Crystal Palace player. It doesn't even matter if his name was Jesus Christ. Uh, it's just not on for me. Now, maybe I'm being too salary sensitive. Uh, it's just it's not there. Um, maybe on Fandle you could talk me into it because I know they do produce a lot of chances. Uh, but in terms of... Yeah... Just another 7.5 to throw in the mix, maybe. I, like, yeah. The, the, the issue with this build right here for cash, though it's incredibly powerful, um, not that, not that, sorry, is due to the fact that you can't take a Hazard now and you can't take uh, a Willian and you can't take a Paul Pogba or a Philippe Anderson or a Ryan Frazier. Uh, so it, it's really tough what you're buying into, but at the same time, if you, if you believe like, yeah, Marshall's really the guy this slate, you're probably going to need to spend down a midfield across the board. Uh, I would probably take out Moutinho and put in Hazard, but considering we're talking about him right now in this game, we'll just keep him Moutinho for the sake of it. Um, it yeah, this this is tough. I want to say one nothing, two nothing Wolves. But Palace are just as likely to come out of nowhere and do what they do, which is be incredibly frustrating for DFS. Um, I'm going to say 2 nothing Wolves just for a little reality check for Palace, but this really wouldn't surprise me if it ended 1-1. Next game on the slate, last game on the slate, we have my new favorite uh, I shouldn't say my new favorite, my old favorite, new talking about uh, team Manchester United traveling to Newcastle. So, um, how to put this, how to put this, how to word this. Manchester United traveling to Newcastle under Mourinho was some of the most concerning slates of the season. There, I got it out. That's a really simple, straightforward, and sensible way to put it. Every time, uh, I shouldn't say every time, sorry. When United travel to Newcastle under Mourinho, they generally falter due to their nature of looking to defend first, which Newcastle just choose to 
bits. I don't see that being the case this late. I don't see United sitting back like they usually do, and I don't see Newcastle winning this game. Now, United have only kept kept Kyle uh, South Park. Sorry if anyone didn't understand that joke and thought that was really weird. Uh, that was Kyle, uh, a little Cartman talk. Um, Man United have kept only two clean sheets all season, and they haven't kept one since September. So, um, Newcastle really should score. They've historically done really well scoring against Man United. Uh, in particular, I won a ton of money last year on this exact slate with Matt Ritchie uh, scoring two goals against DeGay. Um, now, are, are, am I going to sit here and say, yeah, 7.2 is just so much fun? No, not at all. It's probably a little bit too high, especially considering Newcastle have one of the worst scoring records in the league. Uh, it's just... It's more of a deep GPP play for sure. For sure. I think that's actually a safer way to describe that. Uh, this is a GPP play. If you want to take Matt Ritchie, fade him for cash this slate. It's just not on. Uh, United are too good. Take him in GPP. Now, in terms of Rondon, again, another really good GPP play. Playing 90 minutes, scoring a goal with a little bit of floor on it. The big issue is that Newcastle don't score a lot of goals, let alone a lot of goals in the same game. So unless Rondon gets a goal and an assist, like literally sees every ounce of production that comes from the Newcastle goal or goals, uh, he's done. He'll just as likely finish at four fantasy points than he would uh, a goal's worth. So yeah, I'm a little bit hesitant on that, but fire up the United. Uh, it's Outside the defense here, it's just you can't miss... Pog was one of my favorite GPP plays this slate. He's looking to be the first Man United player to score two goals in three straight games since Cristiano Ronaldo did it in 2006. Uh, am I as supportive as of Pogba as I was and am of Ronaldo? Absolutely not. Is there any player on United who would have a glimmer of hope to break that Cristiano Ronaldo record and their name isn't Paul Pogba? Probably not. They're going to be really pushed. So Pogba has a real chance. I don't support it, but uh, he's still one of my favorite GPP plays of the slate. Um, you can go Lingard. You can go Marshall. Uh, you can even drop down a little bit and go some Mata if you want, if he starts, uh, and try and get a little bit of uh, a floor. I dropped Mata over the weekend. Matic, excuse me, over the weekend when he scored. Um, I shouldn't say over the weekend against Huddersfield last week, and uh, when he scored, and I was really bummed because I had one of the nuts cards as is that would have set me completely over the top. But yeah, it, it, Rashford. It's tough to know if I, I I have Rashford my season long. I've kept him forever. He's been doing awesome. He's great, but he's getting to the point where he should be really tired. And Sanchez is getting to the point where he should be coming back. Now, there are some um, rumors surrounding Romeo Lukaku and that he may uh, be being transferred here sooner rather than later. So, uh, I don't mind at 7.6K. Again, it's... He will need the start, and he would need to play 90 minutes. The 90 minutes we're kind of guessing about. But if he starts, I wouldn't mind it for GPP. Again, I talked about this last Man United uh, time against Huddersfield, and they did well. You can definitely get away with the Man United stack today. Um, even going like as full throttle as you possibly can. Um, now, obviously, this isn't ideal. That's not enough money left. Maybe drop some of that. Maybe drop Pogba if you want uh, for a little bit more offensive upside. But yeah, uh, I have no problem getting in three to four United players this slate and chasing another super high ceiling. Uh, if I was to play Chelsea, I'm just taking Hazard or maybe William. Maybe, maybe William and Hazard stack together, but that would absolutely crush the rest of your card's uh, ability to buy any kind of salary. So. Uh, I would probably go, you know, the, the classic Alonzo Hazard as a stack if they're both starting on the left-hand side. Uh, but uh, outside of that stack, if you're looking to spend up, United are definitely going to be worth it this late. Um, now, I do have some concerns around Newcastle's ability to keep games close. Uh, that being said, against attacking, uh, better attacking teams, they have been overwhelmed for multiple goals. So, um 
I think it has warrant to say Man United may not score enough goals, but I don't think there's much reason to suggest Man United won't win. Uh, they're still riding high on uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Let's ride this wave. Um, I like the Man United stack idea. They're probably conceding, though, taking away from their ceiling. At least 2-1 United, maybe 3-1 if they get lucky. It also wouldn't surprise me to see this game draw 1-1-2-2. That's the slate, everyone. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Rad Rob Diamond on Twitter. Sir Robert Six and all the main sites. Rotopros.com. Get over. Check us out. Like. Subscribe. Comment. Uh, get at me with any questions. Uh, good luck, everyone, today. Hopefully see you at the top of the leaderboards. Much love. Take care.